Charles Foster Kane is the titular character in Orson Welles' 1941 classic, Citizen Kane. Played by Welles himself, Kane was a mirror image of real-life businessman William Randolph Hearst. Kane's life began as many do. Small. Ordinary. He was born in Little Salem, Colorado in the early 1860s to a mother who lived a simple life in a wooden cabin. Kane grew to enjoy the outdoors and loved playing in the snow with his sled, Rosebud. One day, Kane's mother receives an old mine as a payment for room and board. The mine was thought to not have any significant value whatsoever. This would soon prove to be incorrect, as the mine was actually chock full of gold, instantly bumping the family into immense wealth. Kane's mother places Kane and the fortune in the hands of Walter Parks Thatcher, a successful and prestigious banker. It is from this point on that Thatcher essentially raises Kane into adulthood. Kane manages to get into some of the finest colleges the world has to offer. This would be the dream of many students Kane's age, however, Kane aims to misbehave and he is expelled from numerous colleges such as Harvard and Princeton. You see, Kane harbors resentment at his situation. He never wanted to be sent away from his home. He was happy there in the snow with his mother and his sled. He never wanted the new luxury that his life was now riddled with and this drove him to act out. At the age of 25, control of his mother's fortune goes to Kane. The first thing he does with his money is buy a newspaper, the New York Daily Inquirer. In the first issue Kane published, he expressed an intent to always be honest and straightforward with the readers, as well as to promote candidates who would benefit the common citizen. Going against the financially sound method, Kane's newspaper constantly preaches against big businesses, some of which directly benefit Kane. Meanwhile, Kane uses his own money to finance the newspaper, which is struggling to make a profit on its own. He famously remarked to Thatcher, You're right, Mr. Thatcher. I did lose a million dollars last year. I expect to lose a million dollars this year. I expect to lose a million dollars next year. You know, Mr. Thatcher, at the rate of a million dollars a year, I'll have to close this place in... 60 years. As the years go by, however, Kane's morals begin to bend and twist into budding knots of corruption. His journalism tactics dip to the level of using yellow journalism to radically sensationalize stories. Meanwhile, Kane marries Emily Monroe Norton, the niece of the President of the United States. And things start off well for the couple, but once the honeymoon phase passes, their marriage goes up in flames. Kane simply doesn't give the woman the time she needs and is far too wrapped up in his newspaper. They do have a son during this time, who is also named Charles Foster Kane. Kane then has an affair with an aspiring singer named Susan Alexander. Meanwhile, Kane decides to get involved in politics himself. He runs for governor of New York. He runs against James W. Geddes, a supposedly crooked politician. His campaign picks up steam and he looks to be the favorite in the race. Until Geddes uncovers the affair that Kane had with Susan Alexander. He threatens to expose Kane's affair to the public unless Kane bows out of the race, but Kane refuses, thinking himself unbeatable. The scandal goes public, the election happens, and, well, Kane was very beatable. He loses the election in an absolute landslide. To add insult to injury, his wife divorces him. Soon after, Kane marries Susan Alexander and begins to push her into a career as an opera singer. The problem is that she's not very good at singing. Her shows get poor reviews and she is ridiculed for her terrible performances. Kane's best friend and right-hand man at the newspaper, Jedediah Leland, quits, repulsed by Kane's ignorance and his loss of integrity. Things only continue to get worse for Charles Foster Kane as in 1918 his ex-wife and son both were killed in a car crash. Soon after, Susan attempts to kill herself but fails. Kane finally relents and allows her to give up her career as an opera singer. Kane and Susan begin to spend more and more of their time in their lavish estate called Xanadu. This dark, brooding, and gigantic estate symbolizes the dark wealth and power that Kane has accrued over the course of his life. When the Great Depression hits, Kane is forced to scale back his businesses. He keeps control over his newspaper, but surrenders control over his other business ventures to Thatcher. Susan is driven mad by the uneventful times at the mansion and by living under Kane's boot, so she leaves him. When Kane discovers Susan has left, he trashes her room out of fury, breaking everything he can get his hands on. 
Charles Foster Kane is now utterly alone. Everyone he has ever cared about in his life has either sent him away or left him. He spends his final years as a recluse in his mansion, which slowly crumbles into disorder. In 1941, Kane utters a final word and then dies. The word? Well, it was Rosebud. You may recall Rosebud was the word on Kane's sled he loved so much as a boy. You see, Kane had noble intentions from the beginning, but the influence of wealth and power corrupted his once pure heart and warped him into a tyrannical, old recluse. He allowed himself to lose sight of everything he once stood for, all in the name of power. However, deep in his heart, even in his final moment, Cain longed to go back to a simpler time, to a simpler place, to when he was just a boy, playing with a sled in the snow. <laughs>